In 1962, early in May, we had a meeting with President Kennedy in the Oval Office. And it was great in talking to the President. He couldn't have been nicer to us. I was accompanied by Dr. Leonard Larson, our President. The President thanked the AMA for what they had done in working with the government over the years. In particular, pointed out the one in the tip polio epidemic when so many doctors across the country volunteered their efforts to see that all the children could be immunized. He said, now we come to this matter of King Anderson legislation. He said, I've been told we have the vote. I said, Mr. President, we appreciate you giving us this time. And our position is very simple. The American Medical Association has always felt and still feels today that Anybody in this nation who needs medical care should have it when they need it, as long as they need it, whether they can pay for it or not. But we think it doesn't make sense. And it isn't wise, nor is it fair, to put a tax on young working America to pay for everybody just because they've had a birthday over the age of 65. I said, Mr. President, We've got a man in Miami, his name is Arthur Vining Davis, former president of the world of the Alcoa, Aluminum Corporation of America. He's, he was in his 90s. I said, he can afford to pay his own bills. The president said, doctor, I know all about you from our mutual friend, Senator Smathers. I'm not going to debate with you. You debate Mr. Ribicoff, who was sitting alongside of him. I said, but Mr. President, I've been up there in Palm Beach County. I've seen that beautiful home that your family has. And I understand a member of your family has recently been ill, and he's over the age of 65. The president leaned forward. He was in his rocking chair, about as close to me as I was to one of my daughters a few minutes ago. And he said, Doctor, you know, if he didn't pay him, I'd have to. <laughs> but president Kennedy <coughs> was scheduled to speak in Madison Square Garden. Well. The story says that on his way to the garden, the president had the speech prepared for him by Wilbur Cohen of ATW and Walter Ruther's people. And he put it aside and he ad-libbed. And you know, not one word did he say in favor of King Anderson. Not one word did he say against the American Medical Association's position. Not one. And then I remembered when we left, when we were leaving the president, he gave me a warm double handshake. Looked straight at me and he said, Thank you for coming. When I got to the airport, I called George Mathers. I said, George, I just wanted to thank you for setting up the meeting with the president. He said, Ed, you're a little late. He called first. I said, what did he have to say? He said, Ed, he isn't going to give you any trouble. And as I just told you, at his presentation, he never said a word in favor of King Anderson. He never said a word against our position. Well, as you know, I had the opportunity the next night to speak. Those of you who heard his speech might remember at the end of his speech, he said, you're going to hear from your doctors. He knew that I was going to speak for the profession the next day. Well, you heard a little bit about our response at the garden and some of our predictions. What would happen if it was passed? My colleagues ask me, would I feel nervous or foolish addressing 18,000 empty seats in this hall? My answer, no. The idea came up, what about an audience made up of men and women and children invited here by doctors? No, we will not trade on this. Let these seats stay empty. It may help us get across to the American people the grossly unfair disadvantage under which we doctors are laboring to make our voices and our reasons heard.
We doctors fear that the American public is in danger of being blitzed, brainwashed, and bandwagoned into swallowing the idea that the King-Anderson bill is the only proposal, the only program that offers medical care for the aged, that there is nothing else. Well, let's put that outrageously false idea on the bandwagon and send it back where it came from. Just two years ago, your Congress in Washington enacted into law the Kerr-Mills Medical Aid to the Aged Program. The Kerr-Mills law has already been accepted by 38 states and is being considered by others. It's on the books. It's a brand new national law. Why aren't you hearing more about it? It works. The American Medical Association and most doctors in this country supported and do support the Kerr-Mills law because we see it as a desirable supplement to one of the greatest social advances of our generation. I mean the spectacular growth of private voluntary health insurance systems to which millions of Americans already belong. Of our 17 million people past 65, over half, 53%, or 9 million, three times as many as 10 years ago, already are covered by some form of voluntary health insurance or prepayment plan. This is a spectacular forward movement. Insurance actuaries estimate that by 1970, 80 to 90 percent of the aged will be covered by private programs. Of course, there will always be a number of people who are truly indigent or who just cannot pay for their medical needs. That is where the Kerr-Mills Medical Aid for the Aged Law comes in. The worst thing the King-Anderson crowd can find to say about the Kerr-Mills Law is that it requires a means test. Now let us make an x-ray examination of what they are attempting to sell you. The American taxpayer, whose payroll tax would be hiked by as much as 17% to start with, in order to pay for this program, certainly has a right to question the free ride. Those who do not need these benefits would be taking at the expense of his children. After you left the hospital or nursing home, you wouldn't be eligible for further hospital benefits for at least three months. Don't have a relapse or get sick again. If illness required hospitalization for more than 30 days, it'd have to be passed on by a special committee who'd have to consider a lot of other people too, don't you know? After all, the government has to treat everyone fair and equal, don't you know? They know all about how to make things exactly alike, like human illnesses like a broken toe and cancer. That the only drugs that would be paid for are those you'd get at the hospital or nursing home, and that many important drugs used today do not appear on the list approved for hospitals, and that a prescription made by your doctor in his office or your home is not covered by the King Anderson bill? This bill would put the government smack into your hospitals, defining services, setting standards, establishing committees, calling for reports, deciding who gets in and who gets out, what they get and what they don't get, even getting into the teaching of medicine, and all the time imposing a federally administered financial budget on our houses of mercy and healing. Ladies and gentlemen, this King Anderson bill is a cruel hoax and a delusion. It wastefully covers millions who do not need it, it heartlessly ignores millions who do need coverage. It is not true insurance. It will create an enormous and unpredictable burden on every working taxpayer. It offers sharply limited benefits. It will undercut and destroy the wholesome growth of private voluntary insurance and prepayment health programs for the aged, which offer flexible benefits in the full range of an individual's needs. It will lower the quality and availability of hospital services throughout our country. It will stand between the patient and his doctor. And it will serve as a forerunner of a different system of medicine for all Americans. Everyone knows there's more money in mass production, but that is beside the point. The American system of medicine is a system of quality medicine, not mass production medicine. It is a system of private medicine practiced by private doctors treating private patients, free to make decisions based on patients' specific medical needs and nothing else.
doctors, as everyone else, take an interest in public affairs. We know that our young president is popular. Some reports say that he is at the peak of his popularity at the moment. But we ask that you do not equate popularity with infallibility. All of you who occupied these 18,000 seats yesterday, you are at home now. You have time to think. You have time to ask your doctor. To the millions of Americans who may have a doubt, who, who may want to take a moment to hear the views of one they know and trust, I implore you, ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Thank you. Your doctor reports has been brought to you by the American Medical Association on behalf of Physicians of America. On July 17, 1962, all senators voting, one sick in a wheelchair, the final vote 52 to 48, the Wagner-Murray-Dingle bill to pro provide medical care by way of Social Security was defeated in 43, 45, 47, 49, and for the fifth time on July 17, 1967. Not for two more years did it come to a vote, and not for three more until the crime of the century gave us the LBJ and socialized medicine for all of us over the age of 65. A recent book written by Mr. Erwin Lunger, Unger was entitled The Best of Intentions, The Triumphs and Failures of the Great Society. He analyzes the effect of the Medicare and Medicaid programs instituted in 1965 and concludes that President Lyndon Johnson and colleagues create at least, at least, a part of a health Dracula that is now draining the lifeblood of the nation. In his first inaugural address, President Ronald Reagan declared that bureaucratic government has become a danger to the survival of our freedoms. Since the days of Ronald Reagan, Health care has become the most overregulated, bureaucratically controlled industry in America. And what is called an American health care crisis should properly be called by its true label, Made in Washington. <laughs>